Hello everybody, it's the Historical Gamer once again, and today we are going to be returning to Panzer Corps 2. This is part 2, or I guess episode 2, of a Let's Play series. Well, not even really a Let's Play series, it is a tournament which is being run by the folks at Slytherin in which you get to play against other streamers. There were eight people invited. I was one of eight to play in what they're calling the Clash of the Streamers, which is a three-round tournament. You know, you go eight, four, two, uh, of eight streamers playing against each other, I guess, to win a tournament. I don't know that there's any... There's, I don't think there's anything for winning it, uh, but it is basically the second round. In the first round, uh, we were victorious in a scenario in Poland, and in this round, we will be playing against Twiglets2, uh, who is a Twitch and YouTuber uh, who uh, won his first round match and is facing off against me. Now, in the first round, we played the Battle of the Bug River, which was in Poland. In the second round, we will be playing the Battle for Kazarin Pass. Ignore all the stuff on the right about round six. Uh, there is... I, I think this was originally crafted for a different tournament, but basically this is going to be the Battle of Kazarine. Now we are playing this battle from two sides. I do think it's an interesting battle to watch from both sides, and so I may, at a later date, do the German Let's Play as well. I have recorded all of it, but in today's video we are starting the Allied side of this tournament, uh, which I am playing in. Now... In the deployment phase for Kazarine, you can make adjustments to your particular forces. The allies start with 3,000 uh, prestige points, if you will, that allow them to purchase things, upgrade things, what have you. Um, they also already start with a maxed out, you know, unit complement, right? There's 145 unit slots that are currently occupied by all of the forces you see on the map here. One thing that I do decide to do is try, as much as I can, to lean as heavy as possible into heavy infantry as opposed to standard infantry. So you can see here the unit here, the 4th Great Britain Infantry 1943 version. I undeploy them, I believe, and then go and replace them with... Actually, I, don't, I might even pull them all together. But basically, my, my thought process in this is make as many good quality infantry units as you can so that they can withstand enemy armor attacks. Because Kazarine, the Germans do have two Tiger tank units as well as other Panzer units, which heavily outclass you. The Germans also have better units. The Allied units have a level two experience of five stars, two veterancy. The American and British units have, sorry, two, and the Germans have three. So they're gonna have an advantage in terms of the quality of the units. I also do try to lean a little bit into some anti-aircraft units because it does feel like maybe the German air units are better because of this as well. The Americans don't have P-47s, they don't have P-51s, they do have P-38s, but those don't fare super well against like F-190s, especially when they're at a disadvantage from experience, so that's another thing that I lean heavily into. My strategy as the allies in this game is going to be as aggressive as I possibly can. The terrain can favor the Allies in certain instances, but there's also a lot of open terrain or rough terrain that the Germans can use to move and flank. The Germans only have 15 turns. They start with better units. I think they start with more units, at least up front, where they're close to the front lines, while the Allies are a little bit more spread out. They've got units further in the back. The Allies won't have the same amount of prestige as the Germans, because I believe they start with about a thousand more than the Germans, but they also start with, um, you know, the, the Allies start at a bit of a disadvantage because the Allies are on the defensive, and so every single time the Germans take a city, they get a prestige bonus. The Allies don't unless they retake a city, which I think is unlikely. And so the strategy that I'm going to be following is basically deploying as many units further forward, not in the back near Tebessia, but up close near Sablidia here. That's the city I'm currently redeploying most of my air units to, to try and make sure that we can basically create a bottleneck for the Germans. There is a lot of high ground to play with in this particular turn or scenario, so you need to use the high ground to mitigate the German armor advantages. You're not for better or worse, for realism or not, you are not going to, as the Allies, go toe-to-toe -to -toe with German Tiger tanks 
and win in most of these scenarios. Your best bet is, in my experience, to get infantry on heights overlooking the tigers and then hit the tigers when they're isolated so that you can defeat them in that manner or surround them and just keep pounding on them until eventually they break down. Air units can help a little bit, but again, I think the German Air Force is going to be a little bit too strong for me, and I also think that Air Force units are very expensive, so it's going to be hard for me to maintain a strong uh, force against them. Also, the Allies have great heavy bombers. The B-26 is a good bomber, but they don't have anything like the Stuka from a tactical Air Force point of view. The P-30 is good in ground attack, but it's not like going to do three, four units of damage. It's going to do one or two. The Marauder can do good damage to certain types of units, but it's a twin-engine medium that's really fairly vulnerable, so that's something you got to keep in mind as well. Um, trying to balance upgrading units as much as I can to better units or to, you know, having slightly better units uh, are all sort of strategies that I look to do here. But really, the key in this battle, in my opinion, if you're the Allies is defend this mountain range here, kind of in the middle to front of the map. There's a really narrow pass up to an airfield area where there's an objective. There's an objective on the southern end, southern end of that pass that is adjacent to these mountainous hexes as well. So as much as you can do to get air un or ground units up on these heights overlooking the enemy and then take advantage of that when the enemy does show up. The other thing that the game also did talk about in the intro is rail can be useful in this game. So there are rail lines that connect different cities. You can actually, I wonder if a Valentinian 4 would actually be good against a Tiger. I think technically the best tank unit I have in this ends up being a, um, a Churchill, I think, but I don't actually see a Churchill there. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm mistaken, but the Valentinian looks like it's got a nice big gun, the Valentinian 4. Uh, but yeah, we've got some Churchills there that I think tend to be better. Um, but in any event, uh, really using this mountain range between Sibia and Sibilidia uh, is the important point for the Allies. So I go really aggressive in this gameplay. I basically attack the Germans often to try and keep them off balance, to keep them suppressed, to prevent them from taking the initiative. Because I think when the enemy has a superior force, uh, they can very easily use the initiative to run circles around you, to isolate you, to surround you, and get you to be destroyed. Whereas the Allies, you know... You'd think being on the defensive, maybe you just hole up in your city and let the enemy attack you. And that can be a valid strategy for infantry, but I don't think it's a very good strategy as a whole outside of individual units holding individual bases. Meanwhile, also you can see here I am in the process of making some changes to this Great Britain infantry unit here um, and trying to figure out what the best use of my prestige is. So I have made some tweaks and changes to the starting roster here down by about 100 prestige. Um, you can see we're upgrading this unit to Great Britain Heavy Infantry 43, um, although pulling them out of that front line might actually be better altogether, but I am putting them there, and then um, the both these forward units have Heavy Infantry. I think we do undeploy this. I upgrade to a Sherman Mark 1, which you may or may not agree with this, but the Sherman Mark 1, even the 75mm gun, much better than the Crusader uh, gun uh, in terms of anti-infantry. I think it's slightly inferior against armor, but overall it's a much better, I think anyway, it's a much better, much better unit. The Valentinian, better on armor, obviously, uh, but I don't, I don't think I end up buying any Valentinians, so, or Valentines, why do I keep saying Valentinians? Um, but you can see we upgraded that unit to a Sherman from the Crusader, and then also having some, you know, anti-tank weapons. I didn't go with any towed guns, maybe that would have been a better strategy, I did consider it. Uh, but at the end of the day, I kept uh, I kept my guns mobile with Wolverines, which they can fight against a Tiger okay-ish, but they're not great. Oh, the other thing also worth keeping in mind is when you have units on heights, it extends their radius of fire. So artillery units get more range, uh, anti-tank guns can get more range, even assault guns can get more range. So instead of being a one-range hex, they can be a two-range hex, um, which can be very valuable. And then the other thing I also invest heavily with in this game is going really strong down the artillery route uh, because while the enemy might have superior armor to me in this game, uh, the uh, long toms or the 155 millimeter guns that the Americans have access to just womp. American artillery, great in this game. Uh, so those are all things to consider. 
But that's going to probably wrap it up here for this first turn. So let's go ahead and jump ahead to the actual first replay and see how things play out. Oh, one other thing also is that uh, the game will give... So the way points work is you get points based on the value of the units destroyed. And then you also get points based on the hexes that you take. So if you take objectives, I think you get like 20 victory points. And then you also get points based on if you win. So there's like a 500 point bonus if you outright win the scenario as either side. Which we didn't do in our Poland battle. In our Poland battle, neither side finished. We didn't finish either of the battles. We got close, but and we definitely won. We were certainly outperforming the Germans. And as the Polish and our German units were slightly outperforming the Polish relative to what they did to me. Uh, but we, we certainly didn't get anywhere near, fin I think we were three or four turns away from finishing, so no one got that bonus. Meanwhile, you can see the initial German attacks. They used some Stukas there in that forward uh, infantry unit, and they wiped that heavy infantry unit out. But they didn't take Picon, uh, which is that initial objective. They then rolled their Tiger down the rail line towards Sibledia. Uh, but they ran into some infantry. They did attack our infantry and inflicted 50% casualties on us. However, they did not destroy the infantry unit or even drive it back, so it is still alive. And they they were kind of more passive than I was down near City Borny or um, the other objective further south. So they didn't get super aggressive there. You can see here, I'm trying to figure out, like, all right, I've got these, I've got these P-38s. What am I going to do with them? And you can see if I try and pull them up to these F-190s, they do not fare well against those F-190s or even BF-109s. It's a 6 to 4 ratio against them, um, largely because of the experience. So what actually makes more sense in this case is the Spitfire is a better air-to-air -air unit than the uh, than the P-38. So perhaps using the, the Spitfire to uh, wear down an enemy air unit first and then bring in the fighters, perhaps... Um, that could be a valid strategy. Meanwhile, this heavy infantry unit here, it shows it's going to do three casualties to this Tiger. So we attack it and we do two casualties and we lose five. I'm okay with that trade because at the end of the day, Tigers are very expensive to replace. And I think it is worthwhile to do that. As I said, I am going to play this game very aggressively. So sitting back and waiting for the enemy to pick your units off one by one and destroy you is not my idea of a sound strategy. What I really probably should have done is thrown that infantry unit and pick on up on the heights uh, and then attack the enemy infantry unit north of Funduk, and then we would have had a much better advantage. I don't know if I saw that as an opportunity or not. Um, I don't think when I first started playing the scenario that I fully appreciated the value of the heights. Um, it took me a couple of turns to really start seeing how critical they were in this battle. I'd never played this battle before. Uh, but what you're going to see here for the most of the rest of this turn is us mostly just moving these units that are up in the rear forward toward the uh, toward the main line of fighting. Like I said, I did not want to sit back. I did not want to let the enemy come to me. I wanted to push the initiative and then push forward on the enemy as much as I could. And so that does mean moving into this valley here near Siba, uh, which is going to create a little bit of a bottleneck. But that's okay because the enemy is still too far out to hit my troops in there, and I don't think they have the air power to hit those columns coming through there either without exposing their own aircraft to some pretty dangerous uh, situations. Also, I do have some mobile flak and other units like that, uh, which I can use to minimize the risk. And then also using units back in the rear in convoy mode. Again, they don't really, you know, when you're in trucks like that, you're very vulnerable to enemy air attack, but less of a concern because I think those troops back there are actually out of the range of enemy air units as far back as they are. So you can see here in the south near Sanid, they didn't actually attack the infantry there. I'm going to go ahead and move my Wolverine anti-tank unit up next to Sanid so they can provide support to the infantry there. And then move my... Do I move my Shermans up here to try and bottle the enemy up in this little pass, this little mountain range? There's only two hexes wide between the mountains to the north and south. Again, I go very aggressive here. So I don't go like stupidly aggressive. I don't attack 10 to 1 odds. But if you give me close to one-to-one -one odds, I'm going to attack. If you give me an opportunity to try and pack my units in against yours, then I will also, uh, you know, try to do that where I can create as much as I can do to bottle up the works. The general theory is if the front is, is narrow and the enemy has to go take a full turn to move one hex up into the mountains, that buys me a turn. And I'm working under the assumption that the enemy, you know, has to take this whole map in 15 turns to get the big bonus. They're not going to be able to do that if it takes them seven, eight turns to take the first line of objectives. They won't have time to push in further. At least that's that's the strategy I'm trying to follow here. 
Also, Sublidia is going to end up getting infantry units for sure. Uh, right now it had a Wolverine anti-tank unit. Infantry is vastly superior in defending cities and towns. Um, and so we are going to, we're going to do that. We're going to make sure that we've got units in Subledia. We're going to make sure we have heavy infantry units in Subledia. Attacking a heavy infantry unit in a city with armor in this game is not wise. So we're not going to do it. Um, but you can see here, do we go for the, the 190? Do we go for the BF-109? We do go for the BF-109 with our Spitfire 38th Mark 5B. And you can see actually better odds, better result than we had assumed with the odds. We inflicted four casual or six casualties on them for the loss of four of our own. Um, and then I've got these P-38s, which we're going to try and swing in here and get some two to three odds. Maybe we can fin... Oh, wow. And we get two to four and we shoot the, we shoot the enemy plane straight down. Destroyed one enemy fighter unit destroyed already. They can replace it with some money, but again, they haven't taken anything yet, so that'll be harder for them. It also removes the escort for these bombers because there's now one hex gap between the bombers and the fighters further north, the F 190s. So we can effectively cripple this heavier bomber unit, inflicting 60% casualties on it, so it will not be able to really do much against us either. I'm not going to do anything down at City Bozud. I don't have any additional troops that can move down there really to take that. I might use some uh, tactical bombers here to do some damage to some enemy units that are coming up here. It will expose my, my guys to enemy fighters on the next turn, uh, but I think it probably does make sense to use the B-26 here to do some damage. It does look like there's flak I hadn't predicted, so we will take some damage here from this enemy mobile anti-aircraft gun, but we do inflict two casualties on that uh, self-propelled artillery there. And then I've got uh, an A-20 Havoc, which can't really damage the Tiger, but it can do a little bit of damage to this Panzer IV. Two suppression, one casualty. We've got this, another A-20 Havoc. Again, can't do any damage to that Tiger, uh, but it could do some damage to some other units around here. We'll see where it can all reach. Not a lot of places. Um, and so what we actually decide to do is... Do we bring it onto this infantry, or do we go for the assault gun? I think, I think we go for the assault gun. I don't remember, but of course, enemy has mobile flak back there that I did not see, so we'll bomb it anyway. We only lose one casualty at the end of the day, and we inflict one. Just sort of a slow whittling down of the enemy, because again, if the enemy has to use a turn to reinforce, that's one turn they're not advancing. And again, back to my whole strategy of inflict as many losses on the enemy, make them use as much time as possible, and that will go a long way to assuring victory. Um, that's pretty much it for this turn. I don't think we do any more attacks. I think we whittle around a little bit more, but let's go ahead and jump ahead to the next turn and see what we have in store. I'm sorry, actually, I do have a little bit more attacking here. I did decide not to leave the units up at the front line un unused. So it's kind of trying to figure out like, all right, what am I going to use the Sherman for? Am I going to go for the enemy armor? Am I going to go for... You know, the armor is going to have huge casualties against me. I could try and push forward and do some damage to this enemy infantry in the plains. I didn't know that they had an enemy artillery piece here that is supporting them. So that's, you know, a challenge. So what we could do is we could move this infantry out of Picon uh, to hit this enemy infantry that's in the open. And then that would also soften that enemy infantry up, perhaps, for our armor to hit them. So we move them up to the high ground. You can see they get a very good... Well, they're supposed to get a very good result, three to six. They only got four to five. Then we can go ahead and hit the weakened enemy infantry with our armor, and then we uh, have them down seven, seven hit points from 15 to eight. So that infantry unit is, again, going to be greatly reduced in its effectiveness. We can put our artillery up here on the heights. We can see the range extend because of that. And then we can go ahead and bombard this uh, tiger tank. We suppress it a little bit, which will make them less effective in their next turn's attack. They'll probably destroy that infantry there in the open, but I would hope with the suppression, they'll be unlikely to get an overrun so that they'll only be able to do the one attack. At least that's the hope. Um, I would assume Pecon will fall next turn on uh, that British uh, objective there, uh, but we will see. Anyway, we're going to jump ahead to the next turn. So moving forward to turn number two in this replay. Uh, again, still just focusing on the Americans. I will show you the German Let's Play as well. Uh, and as a reminder, this is the semifinals of this tournament. There will be one more round after this. If if I win, if I lose, I'm knocked out. So you can see the enemy Stug moved into Picon. They took the objective. They then used their Panzer IV after weakening it with their Stug to destroy that Sherman. They then moved the Panzer IV up to destroy and overrun the infantry. Overruns basically mean you can attack again and sometimes even move, depending on how many hit points you have. Enemy F-190 comes up here to, you know, hurt this 
medium bomber. I think it's a Havoc up there to move some uh, artillery to move against my infantry in the heights here. And then they use their infantry to attack my infantry in the heights, and they do manage to destroy it. Nonetheless, they did use like four or five units just destroying that infantry unit up there. So those guys, while they died, in my opinion, they did their job and bought some time. You can see the second enemy Tiger tank down here near uh, City Botsud. The main objective this turn for the infantry in that town is to buy time. There's only one hex the enemy can approach the town through. You can see they've got a very narrow front that they can move through. And so the, the general hope is that we can manage to bottle the enemy up for another turn so that they don't take the objective until next turn. You can see they are moving their armor and artillery up into the, the mountains around the objective, so they will be down into the plains in the following turn, uh, so that, that objective will almost certainly fall in the next turn, if not still on this turn, if they make a successful attack. And they do, they do manage to drive them back um, and then follow up that attack with uh, another armored assault here, and they take the objective. So they did manage to do that, and then they're... Airborne, or I guess their, their Stuka finishes the infantry off. Nonetheless, uh, they did at least bottle the enemy up there, so there's no break up there on the, in the south on the second turn. We are still trying to move our troops forward through the pass, so the enemy, if they, if they strike quickly, they can really catch the allies in a rough spot, but I don't think they've really struck quickly. They've done what they probably should. They haven't done much more than that. Um, I do love this 155 millimeter M12 on the, on the mountains here. You can see the Germans are a little bit strung out uh, in the in the open down here. So perhaps this Panzer IV is a little bit exposed. Perhaps we can we can hit it with some of these troops coming up the pass. We're going to get this uh, 40 millimeter Bofors onto the heights. One because it gives it better range. Two because it will actually uh, open up the the roadway here for our troops to move through. So we've got these Wolverines, these these heavy infantry, and these Shermans. We could potentially use them to uh, attack that enemy enemy tank unit there, that Panzer IV. We've got a B-26, but it's very badly damaged, so we can go ahead and use some of our 2800 prestige left to replace its casualties. It did get shot up by German fighters last turn, um, but the Allies, again, they don't get a ton of, of prestige, so you, you do have to be sparing in how you use that prestige. So right now, I'm just kind of trying to decide, like, what's the best way to use my my units remember we did destroy one enemy air unit last turn don't see any stukas or anything like that that are within range of my fighters at the moment um yeah so i kind of i'm bouncing around a lot in this particular turn here we're gonna try and get our sherman let's see here the enemy infantry pretty resilient to my wolverine but we can move this Sherman up into the mountains north of Sened, if that's how you pronounce it. We have no troops in Gafsa, the actual objective back here. We pulled the infantry out of that town and moved them to the southern extreme of the map. I don't know what the no truck icon means. If that means you lose your truck transport to leave it behind, or if it just means... I, I don't know. But basically, just again, down here, it's a pretty narrow front, trying to bottle the enemy up as much as we can. Place our losses here in the town of Sened, let the troops re-dig in. And then we do have some additional Shermans coming up here, M4A3s. I don't think you've got the 76mm Sherman at this stage of the conflict. So move our infantry up here to have the high ground to prevent any easy breakthrough from the enemy around the flank. Or if they do kind of approach there, perhaps have a advantageous engagement. We can move their wolverines up onto the heights too. Shoot down on any enemy troops. And then we can also move the Sherman up here on the heights. We've got this additional Sherman down here. And you can also see some infantry or artillery, whatever, in a half track up at the edge of our line of sight there perhaps uh, being something to be worried about. They might be trying to go in this general area south of Sibelidia, this rough terrain here. They could be trying to go be shoot the gap between those mountains and, uh, and, and go for us there, but um, not totally clear. Meanwhile, we do go ahead and reinforce the B-26s, spending some valuable prestige there to get 
the elite replacements. Bring the A-20 down here. No enemy air, so we can go ahead and bomb that enemy uh, Panzer IV. Our uh, Spitfire can... Or not Spit, oh, nice. So we can actually attack this enemy Stuka here. I was going to go for the recon truck and get two casualties on that, but... Gladly, we'll, uh, we'll try and shoot down an enemy tactical air unit. Those Stukas are very vulnerable, as you can see there. Five casualties to one. But they're also incredibly valuable in terms of the amount of damage they can do to armor units compared to what we have. So the ability to destroy a Stuka there, pretty, pretty important for us in terms of having some success there. Probably just makes sense to have the Spitfire who helped shoot down the BF-109 last turn reinforce this turn. Same for the uh, additional A-20 Havoc up there. We can push our M4A-3. We could do in between. There's two recon trucks down here. We've also got one further back in M4A-1. We can kind of attack there against that recon truck. Recon vehicles are very valuable, by the way. They're not the best fighters, but they do a tremendous job of telling you what you should be doing, basically, because they give you much better line of sight. So when you're on the offensive in a map like this, you really need those vehicles. And so we did destroy that one there with a concentrated armored thrust just against the recon vehicles. And then we did inflict 40% casualties on another recon vehicle um, to sort of continue the assault there. Meanwhile, we've got our Crusader, Mark III's, Churchill's, all in this sort of pass area. Use our artillery to either suppress those Tigers, hit that infantry, or some of the, that armor. Can also move forward our breech loading 7.2 inch artillery piece as well, and even hit Picon from there, and maybe hit that enemy Stug 3G, suppress it a bit. Go ahead and uh, see what we can do here. And again, destroying enemy units is valuable too from a victory point perspective in this game, as we said earlier in this multiplayer tournament. So destroying the Stuka is valuable just in of itself. So we bombarded and suppressed that. I think that's a Panzer IV with a short barrel. Go ahead and attack and... We'll take some casualties, but we drove that Panzer IV back. Should keep Sublidia safe this turn. There's nothing adjacent. There's at least a line of armor between it and, you know, the actual objective. So, unlikely the enemy will run through us uh, that quickly. Well, I don't want to split them. One is send them by train, which we don't have that option. So I was at this point, I was thinking like, what about the train thing? It told us to move units more quickly with the train. And we've got these heavy infantry with no truck transport or anything like that. So how do we want to, how do we want to manage that? You have to be in a town to use trains. So that's why I couldn't do that there. Okay. I don't know if I knew that at the time. Meanwhile, we've also got to move some of these units up through this pass. Get them closer to the fight in the south. Because the enemy is starting to arrive near Sibletia. And our, many of our units are still bottled up on the roadway. So go ahead and move this heavy infantry down through the pass. Make sure that they are not mounted up when they arrive. So that way they are not as vulnerable to enemy air attacks. Go ahead and move our anti-aircraft, self-propelled anti-aircraft gun down to defend the town. Move our Churchill into this pass here. Attack any enemy armor that might try and push between Sibia and Sibelidia. Another Churchill down there, and we'll just sort of move everybody stacked up up through the pass. That being said, I think that about does it for this turn's combat. So we do move some units around here, but in the interest of time, we're going to go ahead and jump ahead a little bit. We're a half hour into this fight, and we're still only on turn two. Um, we do decide we want to put some infantry on this pass here, actually. 
uh, because we did see an enemy half track that looked like it might be trying to go between these two mountains. And so if the enemy did that, they could cut in behind us and take these objectives from the rear. The objectives likely not being well defended. So I decided to put two infantry units there as a blocking force if there's an enemy unit trying to, to shoot between there. We don't have any indication of enemy armor, but we do have that half track, which is likely infantry. And so if we can, we can engage them there in positive defensive terrain, great. Meanwhile, I think this is an example of mounting him up on the train. It is. See him rolling down there toward Ferna. I can't unmount them, though, so they're still on the train, which would be vulnerable to enemy attack from the air. I like to only move my units as far as they are when they have that little checkbox there, that little chevron, because that indicates, hey, they're going to move by truck, but they're going to get off the truck. They still got movement points to get off the truck, and so they won't, they won't be as vulnerable to enemy air attack. Meanwhile, I do shift the rear American armored and artillery units away from Thala down south, more toward the center part of the map, because once you get up in that pass, you can't easily get down to Sublidia, so I do decide to dub to backtrack on some of those units. But like I said, I think that's going to about do it for this turn. No more fighting done here, so let's jump ahead to the next one. Okay, so moving ahead to turn number three, I think it is. We did the setup, turn one, turn two. And here we are into turn three. Germans move some troops north, taking that northern, not really an objective, but still a town they get prestige for taking. We're using some Stukas. We have no uh, anti-aircraft guns in the south near Sened, so enemy air here is largely unopposed. Um, Stug here attacking my Wolverine, and then an air units bombing my Wolverine. Uh, I don't think they can get a unit up on the hill there, though, so it'll probably survive this turn. Meanwhile, they put troops in the overwatch positions near Sened, uh, driving our infantry in that town back. And you can see here, perhaps our guess of putting infantry between those two mountain ranges, south of Sublidia and north of Sned, might be smart, because it looks like they're moving infantry and armor south of the river, uh, with obviously the goal of bypassing our main defense line and getting into our rear, uh, which would be a problem. So we'll have to see how we adjust to that. Meanwhile, you can see here we've got a P-38 got shot down with almost no resistance against an F-190, uh, likely led by aces. Tiger tank up here against our Wolverine inflicts 50% casualties, and then the following units attack again. So two Tigers in action near Sublidia. Just destroyed that Wolverine, just crippled that Crusader. Uh, again, they didn't get close to taking the town, but they did just cripple our armor, or at least a couple of units in front of the town. Uh, there so thankfully we've got more troops coming down the pass that we can shove into the meat grinder uh, But that was a pretty pretty good turn for him. I would say in terms of casualties Meanwhile, my tanks cannot attack favorably against the enemy armor up there in the south because they are also fighting uh, At a disadvantage the both sides are in a uh, in, in the high ground So we've got our b26s here. I'm trying to figure out like where does it make sense to use them? Um, we also have enemy Units sort of stacking up. They've gotten across the river here in the south, and these two formations here in the center and in the north are now meeting up. So how do you best defeat enemy Tiger tanks? That's the question for me in this. Um, so I could use my air units against some lighter targets, like these Panzer 3Ms or these recon vehicles or Stugs. We could also swing him south against the infantry, trying to move through the unopposed area. Or we could go for this half-track, which is a pioneer unit, which is a engineering unit, which would be a very valuable thing to destroy because those pioneers are going to be great at ta attacking fixed fortifications or fixed towns, like with our dug-in troops. Um, but, you know, by, in by damaging them essentially for free from the air while they're mounted up in trucks and very vulnerable, uh, that's a good, a good outcome for us. Meanwhile, I use my heavy artillery to try and suppress this Tiger tank and actually inflict a casualty on them, which I was not expecting. Um, so that that's good. They're down to 50% in that one Tiger tank unit. Use our P-38s here to strafe them and do a little bit more suppression damage. You can see they get less effective attacking me if they're suppressed. You can see here my armor is like, all right, one to zero. Like, you're not getting crippled, but you're also not really doing much damage in that case. 
It's about using our Spitfires. We saw all those enemy air units show up in the south, but we didn't... We didn't have any air units down there. So I do swing my Spitfire over here to try and engage this Fock Wolf 190A. We do take heavier losses, but I think it's worth it to try and cripple this enemy ace. Maybe put them at a, at a point where they have to spend some points on... Re, you know, not using that air unit next turn and reinforcing. I followed up with an attack with my P-38. It might have been better to move both units at the same time to have a mass attack, but... Oh well. I was thinking about moving anti-aircraft forward, but decided not to. So we've still got these troops near Sibia. Move this artillery south, I think. Try and hit the enemy armor or infantry here. Go with the enemy armor. It's already suppressed, so now they took three casualties from that 7.2 inch cannon. And now I can move my Sherman here, my M4A3 if I want, to try and flank the enemy. I just attacked my 105 against the Tiger there, didn't do any damage. So I'll move my Churchill down here. Tried attacking this enemy tiger here. I figured the odds aren't good, but maybe I would get him to, you know, into the red, and then we could effectively damage them, but it didn't work out that way. And then I do move my Churchill out here to try and retake Pecone, because that is an objective hex, and so my thought is I can sneak in behind the enemy as they try to advance in Sibletia, and then maybe I can force them to pull some troops back to the north, uh, you know, because of the losses they take. So this enemy anti-aircraft gun is kind of a pain in the ass there. I got any aircraft guns on both sides. And my uh, Havocs don't appear to be very effective, so I do swing them south against the Panzermark III in the rough terrain. Do some suppression damage. Got another one of them here. Go for that Panzermark III. Damage and suppression. Move this Great Britain Heavy Infantry also toward Picon if we want. So it doesn't really make sense to move them against the enemy armor in the heights. Pull the Wolverine back, maybe it won't get destroyed, or actually just reinforce in place. Move the infantry in the mountains forward here and go after the Stug 3. Stugs are assault guns, not great unsupported in heavy terrain against infantry, so we drove them back. Attacked with our Sherman here south of Sned. Badly damaging this enemy infantry unit here. Move the M4A3 that is on the heights overlooking the town to try and destroy this 5th wear infantry unit. We don't manage to do that, so on the southern edge of the town we do manage to push back an infantry unit and an armored unit, nearly destroying both. But now that the armor unit of ours is stuck in the town of Sned, they're going to be uh, fighting at a disadvantage. Armor unit is not as effective in, in a town. Nonetheless, we probably delayed a push west by at least another turn. Because they're going to have to retake Sned now, and I don't think they're likely to get an overrun. We can move this 19th Heavy Weapons unit south toward Gafsa. And now that they're in the town, they can unmount, and we can move them... Either keep them in the town to protect against an enemy attack, or move them north here. We decide to move them north. We've got the 11th U.S. Heavy Infantry here. We can put into this heights to guard this, this pass here. Against the enemy troops, which felt like they were trying to go between us. And then get some additional infantry into some of these towns, which are our objectives. Move up the artillery and armor in the rear. And I think that about does it for this turn. So 
We do some additional redeployment, but mostly it's just pulling troops forward that are in the rear, uh, and there's no more attacking. So let's go ahead and jump ahead to the next turn. All right, so at this point, we are moving forward, and our German campaign is definitely going better. We are still bottled up. We haven't taken a whole bunch of stuff yet at this point in the game, but we are still bottled up, and, and uh, you know we are doing better than the Germans are against us. Meanwhile, you can see they destroyed that armored uni unit of ours pretty easily. I'm surprised they didn't actually kill any infantry there with that Nebeverfer rocket attack. They moved through the pass, if you will, with some pioneers against my infantry. They do drive my heavy infantry back, but they do lose some meaningful casualties against me uh, in both infantry units there, in both the Pioneer and the Vare infantry. And then they move their Panzer M3s up, trying to, again, break into the center of my lines. This is a battle that feels, at this point, very close. Um, you can see they had to spend this turn reinforcing both their infantry and their Stug 3 south of Sned. Meanwhile, they also have to go ahead and try and dislodge my Sherman that is in the actual city, and they do manage to drive us out and retake the objective right away, um, and uh, also destroy that Sherman there. But despite it being on the heights, it's suppressed enough that they're able to, you know, destroy it. They try to race their Panzers forward here. I'm not really sure where that one was going. You know, they got another objective down here they got to take. I think he's starting to get a little bit impatient, because, like, I'm not sure why you'd race your Panzer there way ahead. Like, you've got this objective on the southern left portion of the, the map. Um, you'd think you would go for that and then move forward for the uh, central objectives with the airfield and whatnot. But you can see he is moving that, that Panzer... What is that, a Mark III or whatever? Uh, north of uh, Gafsa. It looks like he's bypassing Gafska all the same. Uh, meanwhile, we do have one U.S. Heavy Infantry company or whatever uh, that was kind of left behind the 12th. Uh, so, you know, they obviously tried to bypass and tried to race ahead uh, some of these units back here. I actually pull them off the heights here near Sned and then try to attack the town. Um, or at least that was my thought process. All right, so this Wolverine took heavy losses again, so we'll spend some points to reinforce it. This enemy infantry here did manage to push back one of our heavy infantry companies. However, they have another heavy infantry company that they have to deal with now. We have a long tom behind this. We actually have two artillery, three artillery pieces behind this ridge. So we attack with our infantry, wipe out that lead enemy infantry unit, push forward. Now you can see here there's the pioneer unit. I can't attack them this turn, but they are very weak. So our infantry destroyed one of the enemy infantry units. We're now much stronger than the pioneer infantry unit. And so this enemy breakout here in the center of the map, probably not going to work out super well for them. They do have one armored unit, but their infantry is fighting in rough terrain, which will, will give them a considerable defensive bonus. Meanwhile, in the north, basically the major striking forces for both armies are sort of bottled up up here. All right, we've got a zero to three. We can destroy this artillery piece. The Napa Verifer is usually pretty good. So we do manage to destroy that. Unfortunately, infantry units don't generally get overruns, so. And moving my anti-tank gun in there adjacent to that heights would get it destroyed by the enemy infantry on those heights. So instead, we move it north to see if perhaps we can flank Pecon and surprise the enemy. Go ahead and use our anti-aircraft gun here against the enemy recon plane. That little light-looking plane is actually uh, a recon aircraft. 105 millimeter artillery. You can go ahead and pound this enemy pioneer unit. I purchased a couple more Spitfires toward the end of last turn as well to improve my air power. You can see we're running very low on prestige now. We're down to 400. We don't get the advantage of taking towns. The other reason it's very beneficial in this scenario, I think, to be perhaps overly aggressive against the enemy is that because the enemy's barely taken any towns so far, they're not getting as much extra prestige as they would otherwise. But we just destroyed that enemy anti-aircraft gun, so good news there. Should allow us to more easily attack enemy units. And then we attacked and drove back the enemy artillery, so we bring in our Havoc here. To finish off this enemy artillery, there is an enemy anti-aircraft gun still on this height, which I was unaware of, and they do quite a bit of suppression to our air unit there. So, 
I do manage to survive for another turn. But I move my Churchill in here so we can go ahead and hit the enemy artillery. We do. We get an overrun, which means we can attack again. So, we are pushing back the enemy in front of Sibletia. At least temporarily. And again, we're on turn five. We're one-third of the way through the battle. The enemy's only taken a couple of, basically, border objectives. So, I would say, so far, things are going fairly well for us. I'm, I keep trying to figure out, like, how do I move forward to hit that enemy tiger? What can I do there to damage or destroy it? Um, you did see they pulled the one tiger back that had been at 50% casualties to the east. They reinforced it, but that basically removed it from the fight this turn. Probably removed it from being able to do much against the objective either next turn. So probably the earliest they would take Sibletia is, I would guess, turn 7 in a best case scenario. Alright, use our uh, B26 here. You can see it only gets one casualty on the forecast. We're just doing everything you can. We got them fully suppressed. They're red now, which I believe means they don't shoot back. I mean, they do shoot, but they shoot completely ineffectually. So we drove, we drove that enemy unit back to the bridge. My Sherman I would have liked to pursue, but it couldn't quite get there. So go ahead and pursue with the Crusader, with the Crusader Mark III. Drive it back. And with one hit point left, we try and bring, well, we were going to bring the P-38, but it, it didn't have a forecasted hit thing. So we've kind of turned the, the tide here south of this mountain range. Driven back, destroyed one unit, driven back another. We did pull some troops north as well to go after retaking Pecan. We do know there's Germans here up at the very north of the map. They retook that town, but I don't think they're through the heights yet. Okay. Some artillery here. I'll take a one to three. Those are always good odds. So drove that uh, Panzer out of its position. Actually, our infantry. Eh, that's not as good as I would like. We'll go with the we'll go with the Sherman against them. They're technically surrounded, but they didn't surrender there. Could move the infantry out of the town, but then they lose their eight plus entrenchments, which will be very valuable against other armored units. So we're not gonna we're not gonna do that. Instead, we'll maybe we change our anti-aircraft half track to an anti-tank half track. Do a little bit of damage there. Now that they're back adjacent to the town, I can attack out of it without losing my entrenchments. So we do that, and then our level seven Sherman to the north of Sibletia. It's, uh, it's licks in and destroys that enemy. Okay. That, that armored unit needs to reinforce if it can. It's at two hit points. Here in the south. 
go ahead and hit him with some artillery. Suppress the tanks, suppress the infantry, make them completely combat ineffective next turn, so hopefully we can mop them up and their breakthrough in the center, center of the map doesn't work, because we have nothing behind that. We have literally nothing. Meanwhile, attacking these tanks won't bear well for us in the heavy terrain, even though we've got heavy infantry. The heavy infantry defend great when they're in a town or high ground against tanks, but they do not, generally, they're not great at attacking. Okay. Yeah, you can see that 6-1 is just laughable. I'm never going to do that. Alright, so we're just about done with this turn, and we've been going for almost an hour, so I think we'll probably wrap it up after this turn, but I am going to go ahead and try and see if we can knock out this enemy F-190. It is down to 40% strength, so we'll fly one of our Spitfires up against it, and we inflict 50% casualties. Maybe get another Spitfire up that way. There is enemy anti-aircraft guns providing support, but... One-to-one, -one, like I was hoping to be able to destroy it. Could go for the uh, Stuka down here. He's got two, st no, just one Stuka. But the enemy fighter is at such low strength. So I guess we'll go for it. Got it! Shot it down anyway, in spite of the forecast. Good result. Alright, so that's going to basically do it for turn five here. Pretty happy with the results so far. The enemy has been taking heavy losses. They have not taken anything outside just the border towns. Even on most of those towns, they are pretty well bottled up. Um, again, if they can bring their forces to bear against us coherently, they can still do some serious problem. But the lack of infantry and the um, ability for us to hone in on a whole bunch of units against one enemy unit so far has been the edge. And that's where we find ourselves as we wrap up turn number five in the semifinals of the Clash of the Streamers being put on by Slytherin and Matrix Games. Let me know if you guys want to see more of the tournament down below. And without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and sign off. So if you make one ill-advised attack there against that town near Samed, uh, and I think that about does it for the turn. So we'll see what turn number six looks like, but he's rapidly running out of time. Nowhere near half the objectives taken and basically at the halfway point. His only saving grace is that I have no troops in the rear and I've thrown everything forward. So if he does break through, then he could take those well within time. But I guess that's for the later turns to determine. Until next time, this is the Historical Gamer saying once again, thank you very much for watching. And uh, I'm out. Bye-bye.